Hey everyone, we're starting 6.3, our section on binomial and geometric random variables for AP Statistics. By the end of this section, you're going to be able to determine whether the conditions for a binomial setting are met, compute and interpret probabilities involving binomial random variables, calculate the mean and standard deviation of a binomial random variable, as well as interpret these values in context, and then also calculate probabilities involving geometric random variables. A binomial setting arises when we perform several independent trials of the same chance process and record the number of times that a particular outcome occurs. There are four conditions that must be true in order for it to be considered a binomial setting. We're going to use the acronym BINS, B-I-N-S, to help us remember them. B. Is it binary, meaning can the outcomes be classified as either a success or a failure? I, is it independent? Are the trials independent from one another, meaning knowing the result of one trial doesn't have any effect on the result of another trial? N stands for number. In a binomial um, setting, there should be a fixed numbers of trials chosen in advance. And then lastly, S stands for success which it has to do with the probability of success. Is the probability of success the same for each trial? Now, binomial settings are very, very popular on the AP exam. There are um, a lot of free response questions about them, and they're typically the lowest scoring questions on the exam because students oftentimes don't recognize that it is in fact a binomial setting and they can use these strategies to solve the problems. So. It's a type of probability. So we've been talking about probability this whole chapter. So it's a type of probability, but it has a unique situation. So if you're ever encountering a probability problem and you're not sure how to approach it, see if it is binomial. If we have a random variable in a binomial setting, it is called a binomial random variable. So it's still random, just now binomial random. The probability distribution of a binomial random variable is gonna be called a binomial distribution. So it's just a specific type of probability distribution. Um, of those four conditions, I wanna talk a little bit more about the independence condition. Uh, depending on how you collect your data, that's gonna make it look a little bit different for independent. If your data is collected through a sample or a survey, we are probably sampling without replacement, or excuse me, with replacement, without replacement. Um, we're sampling and it needs to be with replacement, otherwise your sample size must be less than 10% of the population. Um, so your population has to be 10 times the size of the sample. This doesn't mean that we want a small sample, all right? Uh, that's actually almost never the case. If we have a sample that is larger than 10% of the population, it just means that we can't use a binomial distribution, all right? We would need to use something else that we don't learn about in AP. Now, if your data is from an experiment, we just need to make sure that the results are reasonably independent from each other and that the results from the first attempt do not influence and or change the second attempt. <clears throat> so binomial distributions are very important in statistics when we want to make inferences about the proportion P of successes in a population. So if you're sampling without replacement, which is typically what's happening, right? We're not putting people back into the population to sample from them again. When you're taking a simple random sample of size n from a population of size n, we can use a binomial distribution as long as the sample size is less than a tenth of the population size. So that's what we were just saying. It's sometimes known as the 10% condition. Now, if you're sampling with replacement, you don't need to worry about it. So let's go through and see if we can determine if something is in fact a binomial setting. Will the random variables have a binomial distribution? So you have to go through your four options, bins, B-I-N-S. First example, roll a fair die 10 times and let X be the number of sixes. So B, is this binomial? Yes, uh, a success here would be considered getting a six, a failure would be getting not a six. I, is it independent? Yes, knowing the outcomes of past roles doesn't provide additional information about future outcomes. N, are we doing this for a set number of trials? 
Yes, they said we're doing it 10 times. S, does this probability of success stay the same for each trial? Yes, it is always going to be 1 sixth. Therefore, this is a binomial setting where N, which is our number of trials, equals 10, and P, our probability of success, is 1 sixth. Next example. You shoot a basketball 20 times from various distances on the court. Let Y equal the number of shots made. So, yes, this is binary, as in either you get a success and you make the shot, or you have a failure and you miss the shot. Independent. Depending on who you are, you might want to argue this, but I believe that it is reasonable to assume that making one shot doesn't change the probability of making the next shot. Okay? Is this being done for a set number of trials? Yes, it said shoot 20 baskets. Does the success probability stay the same for each trial? No, right? Because we're shooting from various distances, you're more likely to make the shot closer to the basket than if you were maybe at half court. So the probability of success changes because shots are taken from various distances. If it was all from the same spot, um, you would think that the probability would stay the same. So therefore, this is not a binomial setting. Next example. Observe the next 100 cars that go by and let C represent the color of the car. Okay. Is this binary? No. There's more than two possible colors here. Also, C wouldn't even be considered a random variable since the outcomes aren't numerical, right? We can't do calculations with reds and silvers and whites. So this is not a binomial setting. Now, let's talk a little bit about calculating binomial probabilities. I'm going to show you the long way to do it, and then I'm going to show you the calculator way, which will make it a lot simpler. Now, in many games involving dice, rolling a six is desirable. The probability of rolling a six when a fair die on, yeah, when rolling a fair die is one six. If X equals the number of sixes in four rolls of a fair die, then X is binomial with N equals four and P equals one six. So we're rolling it four rolls. So that's why N is four. The probability of success is one six. We want to find all of these different outcomes. So first one. What's the chance that you get no sixes? So if you have a one-sixth chance, one chance of success, you have a five-sixth chance of failure, and that would be four failures in a row. So it's just five-six times five-six, so on to the fourth power, and then that gives you 0.48225. Now, you might be wondering, what is this triangle doing here on the right-hand side? Well, this is called Pascal's Triangle. Uh, it's used a lot in mathematics. What we're using it for here can be how many ways something can occur. So let me show you in this example. For the next one, if we want to know the chance you get one success, well, either the first one can be a success followed by three failures, or the second one is a success followed by, you know, two and the one in the beginning. The third one's a success, or the fourth one is a success. So there's four different ways that you could get a success. And that's what this row right here, these numbers, are how many ways that that particular event can occur. So you have a one-sixth chance of getting it, five-sixth chance of not getting it, to the third power, and then there's four different... <laughs> Sorry about that, they're doing intercom testing at school. Um, so there's four different ways that this can be arranged. So that's where we get that value. Same thing for two. First two are good, last two are good, middle two are good, first and third, second and third. Um, so there's six different ways that that can be arranged. And then it goes back from there. So this right here, these, what, five outcomes, these five probabilities, this represents the probability distribution for a binomial distribution, All right? So if you were to make a table, zero chance, or getting zero successes is this, one is that, so on and so forth. Now, you gotta be thinking there must be an easier way. There is, but let's look at this just a little bit more. The binomial coefficient is going to be the number of ways of arranging k successes among n observations. 
So that's what we were just talking about here with the, you know, one and four and six and four. The where that comes from, okay, this is from a combination. Uh, you might have remembered that from Algebra 2, writing a combination um, as opposed to like a permutation. You will not need to calculate this by hand. Your calculator can do it for you. If you go to math and then over to probability and you choose NCR, it just says out of N things, how many ways can you choose R of them? It's not a fraction. So just get that clear. There's no division, division there. So the formula, which is on your formula sheet, can be represented right here. So how many ways can it be arranged? The probability of success to that power, and then the probability of failure to the um, whatever is left of that power. So going back to our dice example that we just saw, uh, if you want to know the chance you get three of them, well, how many ways out of four can you choose three? There's four. Plug everything in, and we get the same response as before. So let's do an example using the long formula, and then we'll do one with the calculator shortcut. In roulette, right, it's a casino game. 18 of the 38 spaces on the wheel are black. So suppose you observe the next... Test, test, one, two, three, test, Sorry. One, two, three. Sorry if I get interrupted, they're doing testing. Uh, we want to know what is the probability that exactly four of the spins land on black, and then what is the probability that at least eight of the spins land on black. So let's see how this works out. This is binomial. So out of the 10 trials, we want to get exactly four. So X, or if you want to call it K, is four. So if you substitute all the values into the formula, we get 10 choose four, times 18 over 38 to the fourth power, and then times 20 over 38 to the sixth power, which ends up being 0.2247. All right, make sure you know how to do that in your calculator. And then the probability of getting at least eight means eight or more out of the 10. So you need to do this formula for both eight and nine and 10, add them together, and that's what you get. This next example, we can do it the long way, but let's talk about the calculator way first, and we can make it faster after that. To do this on your calculator, on a TI, whatever, you want to go to second VARS, just like we do for normal CDF, and now we're doing binome, and we either are going to do PDF or CDF. So when we did normal CDF, we never do the PDF, because P is a precise value. It won't really do well for normal, but for binomial, it's great. Um, and then CDF is always just like for normal. It figures that value and below. And so it's good for doing complements. If you're doing this on the exam, just like we do for normal CDF, you have to define all your variables. So you have to define your N and your P and your K or your X. So when we have our dice example, if we want to know the chance you get doubles twice, out of n four times, and the probability of success is one sixth. You simply plug that into your calculator, so try that now. And then, should they be surprised if they get doubles more than twice? Well, what do you think? Should they be surprised if that happens? So, to figure out more than twice, we have to figure out three and four. So, you can do the complement of one minus probability of x being less than or equal to two. And I set up my formula right, but now as I'm making this video, I realize I put the wrong number here because this was for PDF and not for CDF. So I need to actually fix that. And then whatever this value is, if it's small, we wouldn't be surprised, or we would, we would be surprised if it's big, I wouldn't be surprised. Now, here's an example about sampling without replacement. Take a moment, read it over, see if it makes sense about why the 10% condition um, holds true and why we can't use binomial if it doesn't. Next video we'll talk about mean and standard deviation as well as perhaps talking about geometric.